This has got to be one of the coolest stories behind a burst to show up for sale in a long time. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Hey, it's Heritage Auctions. They're selling the burst. What's new? <laughs> They're doing that all the time. But this just isn't any burst. It has an incredible story behind it that I want to share with you guys. But first, let's just take a look at it. Our headstock is nice and well worn in. Looks like we still have original style tuners on it yet. Looking at the backside, we can tell it's from 1958, so that tells us it likely has a pretty chonky neck. And it must play pretty darn good if it got worn in this hard. As far as the back goes, honestly, pretty darn clean condition for one of these things. I mean, a couple of marks, but no buckle rashes going through it, except for if you count along the edge. And this definitely has some sort of a sun faded look to it. Like you can tell it's a little bit brighter cherry sunburst right here, a little bit right there. But I'm betting underneath this pickguard, it's still very cherry bright. You get a little bit of flame figuring, maybe even a touch of bird's eye here and there. But ladies and gentlemen, what makes this special? Well, it probably has something to do with this guy. And that guy, if you're not familiar, is the George Harrison of the Beatles. Okay, so this 1958 Gibson Les Paul standard is what is known as George's Ransom Les Paul. You know, like somebody took something that's very important to you, they want you to pay $10,000 for you to get it back. So clearly we have a rather twisted tale to share today. All right, so George Harrison. When I think him, I think Rosewood Telecaster because that's like that number one popular rooftop guitar. But no, we're actually gonna talk about his Les Paul named Lucy, you know, that beautiful red one that's also replicated quite often. Gibson Custom Shop did a recreation in 2013 and it looks something like this. Obviously, these are very expensive collector's items. You can definitely get a very similar guitar for a lot less and this guitar has its own story. But the tale for the Ransom Burst starts with the 57 Les Paul standard named Lucy. So that guitar was gifted to George Harrison by his good friend Eric Clapton. But unfortunately, Lucy got stolen in Beverly Hills, but eventually in 1973 made its way to a famous music shop called Wayland Sound City, located on the Sunset Boulevard. And it was at that point in time when that shop sold Lucy to a musician from Mexico named Miguel Ochoa, who was just staying in town visiting one of his friends. So as with a normal purchase, Miguel handed over the money, took the guitar, and he thought that was that. But then, that shop gets a call from George Harrison because he had heard that they had his guitar. So he's like, hey, where's our guitar? And he's like, sorry, we just sold it, but here's the contact information of the guy who bought it. <laughs> so Harrison gets the phone number of the friend that Ochoa was staying with, and apparently he's livid calling them up that he has that guitar. And when his buddy was telling Ochoa about the call from the George Harrison, he thought it was like some kind of a joke. George Harrison's not calling me. This isn't his guitar. But eventually they come in contact and they talk and there's a little bit of negotiation here because Harrison was saying, hey, please sell me that guitar. I will pay you exactly what you paid for it from the store. And I mean, th that's really fair because I mean, currently if there's an actual police report for a guitar, the police will just come and take your guitar. You're out the money if you're in possession of stolen goods. That's why it's tough to be a pawn shop or buy things at a guitar show or something because you never know the history of a guitar. So that was actually a pretty Pretty fair thing of Harrison to offer. However, I mean, we're, we're talking early 70s. Maybe the laws were a little bit different back then. So Ochoa here was considering his options. Famous Beatles man wants his guitar back and I have it. As he maliciously strokes his hypothetical beard. So kind of fed up with the situation, he decided to go back to Mexico with Lucy. So Harrison, rightfully very upset, decided maybe he could sweeten the pot. And he asked him if maybe he would take a trade. So Ochoa demands his 1958 Gibson Les Paul standard that he had purchased from Norman Harris, you know, Norm's rare guitars. But he not only wanted that, he also wanted a Fender Precision Bass. So with that offer on the table to get the guitars back, Harrison agreed because, you know, that was his special guitar. He wanted it back. I totally understand the sentiment of getting a guitar like that back. You can always make more money, but you can't always get back the special guitars. So Ochoa accepts the guitars and trades, and then he kept his ransom, Les Paul, as it's been nicknamed, until 1983 when he needed some money to pay for a house. So he sold it to his boss, Robert Truman, who apparently owned a music store of his own, called Nadine up in Hollywood. And now somehow it is here at Heritage Guitar Auctions. So apparently as far as the originality of this thing sits today, the pickup covers have been on and off, the electronics are original, but apparently the capacitors have been replaced, and the tuners while looking original are not, they're actually earlier no-line Clusons. 
And ah, no, the shaft holes have been sized for Grovers. That means they've been reamed, but somebody has some conversion bushings on there, so it looks normal. It weighs about nine pounds, three ounces, and it still has the original frets on it that have moderate wear. So goodness gracious, what a cool tail. I mean, he bought this from Norm, and it's George Harrison, so you know he at least had it for a little bit. Whether he played it extensively or not, I guess we can't really tell. And it's not 100% fully original, but it's got a story. And for me, stories are what vintage guitars are all about. Now, it'd be cool if we could, you know, back up and verify all these details. I mean, it does look like we have some old photos here with Lucy and the guitar and maybe something that it might have been traded for. Or maybe these are just old random photos in general. It's kind of so grainy, you can't really match things side by side. But perhaps these were photos of the meeting. I'm not entirely too sure. But either way, this burst... It speaks to me. It'd be nice to have a super cool flame top, but I'd probably prefer a plain top when it comes to an actual burst. Even though I have no personal motivation to actually ever own one because th there's just so much money and it. it just becomes a little bit more of a hassle than it's worth. But you're, now you're probably wondering, how much is it? Currently, this is an auction preview. I'm recording this in July and we are not even going to see this auction until September 24th. So hey guys, you've got some time to grab an extra couple 50,000 jobs to get enough money for this thing. I mean, it's hard to tell what the market's going to command at this point in time, but I think it's pretty safe to say somewhere between 250,000 to maybe 400,000 because the way I currently understand the market is like 450 is like the really nice flame tops, whereas the story is kind of replacing some of that. So maybe it'll fall between that 300 to 350 range, but what a cool piece. What else is available? Well, how about a Prince owned and stage played yellow cloud guitar? For me, the cloud guitar has never done much to inspire me to want one or ever play one, but then again, maybe it's because I never saw him live with one of them. Sometimes that's the beauty behind it, but it's an instantly iconic guitar, but you can buy replicas of these on like eBay and AliExpress, all those other weird places. But apparently this particular one was stage used. Now, if I was going to get one of these, I'd want like the purple because that's what he's most well known for, at least in my head. Unfortunately, he is no longer with us. So having a stage played one might be cool for an ultra fan. But what I like here is it's a wraparound bridge. It appears to be all made of brass, at least the saddles. He's got this giant switch tip right there. All of his controls is right there if he needs to modify it. And not only does he have the inlays on the fretboard here, but he also has giant ones on the side. Like they almost span the course of two frets here. So he must have used those a lot to help him see where he was on the fretboard. Now, as far as estimating how much this might be worth, I'll be honest, I have absolutely zero clue. But apparently it is one of about 12. So I guess we'll have to watch that one. And unfortunately with this auction being so far out, I know I'm ahead of the game this time, right guys? Most things don't have images, but we can still look at what we do have. This appears to be like some old Martin style guitar. It's got some really fancy abalone trim, also on the rosette. And then, wow, geez, clean those frets, please. <laughs> those are bad, that corrosion, you need to get it off there, guys. But that is some beautiful inlay work, especially for something this old. You know it had to have been done by hand. And then it looks like we have some sort of a vintage Firebird 3. So dot inlays with bound rosewood fretboard, that's pretty cool. Looks like our bird has been worn off, but something about this cherry color looks so nice. Looks like we had some sort of like a Melody Maker style Vibrola on this at one point in time, but now we've got a wraparound aftermarket bridge that's intonatable. Potentially the original pickups yet. Those knobs look slightly newer than the guitar, but I could be wrong. And the back is also a nice cherry color. And it doesn't look like we have any headstock brakes, cracks, or repairs, so we're all good there. That's actually a pretty attractive offering. Here it looks like we've got a 52 slash 53 Les Paul gold top. We can tell that because of the trapeze tailpiece here. Now this is actually looking pretty clean. You almost have a little bit of a greening effect right there, but nothing too bad. You've got the really aged looking inlays. Looks like somebody put Schaller strap locks on here. I mean, it's definitely a well used vintage guitar, but not in too bad of shape. The headstock's also looking pretty clean. Slightly askew truss rod cover. But then you flip it over to the back and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? So there were all gold Les Paul models, but they were 
all gold. They didn't have natural mahogany necks. So we don't actually have the description on this one, but what I'm betting this started life as was one of the all golds. It started to get a little crusty looking on the back because the gold finish starts to turn green as you're seeing here and then it starts flaking off the neck. So somebody might have had that refinished. Now this could have been an early enough Les Paul model that it didn't actually have a serial number or it might have got lost in that process. The other thinking is this might be a complete refinish and they just did the gold body on the back just for fun. Only time will tell on that one because I have no guide currently. Then we have this pretty cool ES355, it appears, anyways. Somebody has removed our pick guard because the whole off-gassing of the true celluloid products, it hurts your finish. It's the reason why these pickup covers have also turned green. It's because it starts eating away at them. Same reason for right here and right here, even on the trem arm. Those things are dangerous. If you have a real celluloid pick guard, it's going to off-gas. You do not want to keep it inside the case with your guitar. But what's kind of unique is you can tell that that pickup has been flipped. Because normally your pull pieces are down here, but it's been like that for such a long time like this poor soul's just so confused as abr1 <laughs> bridges on backwards too <laughs> maybe there's a method to its madness that's just kind of funny to see everything's backwards on this how about we just flip the truss rod cover for good measure well that's a pretty cool one coming we've also got one of the early les paul sgs with the sideways tram vibrola so you got some pretty nice wood grain on this one looks fairly original for the most part abr one's upside down again but that actually seems to be in pretty clean shape bar any refinished shenanigans that we can't quite tell from photos again no types of information to share today but here's another cool piece of Beatles memorabilia that's coming up. The Beatles signed portion of the wall from The Ed Sullivan Show, done up in 1964. That is a very famous show with a lot of whole bunch of famous people who signed that wall. So they just took that part off and are selling it by themselves. You've got some interesting drawings here and the Bertels were here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that's supposed to be an A, but that looks like an R to me. Are we sure this is authentic heritage? <laughs> but hey, let's check up on the auction that we talked about a couple of months back. So you guys remember I was saying this 1988 Paul McCartney's left-handed Les Paul Custom. I was a little bit sketched out if they would get anywhere close to what they were asking or even a bid. It seems I, I was right because they're currently open to offers and they're starting it at $50,000. So I think they're shooting a bit too high on that. I mean, a guitar like this mint condition of that year, I, I mean, 6,000 would be seriously pushing it in today's market. So even if you gave it a three times premium for Paul McCartney slightly playing it for a day, you're not even to half of what they're asking for. But hey, what do I know when it comes to crazy Beatles memorabilia collectors, right? <laughs> It doesn't seem like that auction had hardly any success because John Wilkinson's BC Rich apparently didn't get any interest either. But oh yes, we actually get to see what that prototype sold for. This is the Dave Grohl 335. So currently we have to make an offer to the owner of $25,000 or more to maybe convince him to sell this piece. See, that's something I can kind of understand. This thing regularly will sell for about 8,000, sometimes a little bit more. People ask like 12,000, but double that for the artist premium and the fact that it's been signed. Yeah, I think that makes some sense. But something I didn't realize last time is this is billed as champagne metallic. So I don't think this is actually the gold one like I thought it was when I first talked about it. This is a custom color that never made it to production. It's either that or it's just a, oops, we messed up. Is it actually called gold? Is it called champagne metallic? But it does look slightly different from gold. So I don't think this is actually a prototype prototype for the whole run. This is just a prototype of a new custom color they were going to try and then they didn't end up doing. But it ended up selling at auction for 16,000, including the buyer's premium. So I kind of regret not watching that a little bit closer because that means if you take that out it only sold for like what 12,000 that definitely was not too crazy wow did I get shown wrong on that 2004 Les Paul custom <laughs> I'm sorry whoever bought that uh I can't remember if that was a charity auction or not it might have been it might make sense for a charity auction but just a Les Paul signed one so I'm gonna make a video called Les Paul's secret code at least I want to because there's different ways that Les Paul signed things so I know that this was not something that was attributed to somebody specific it was more so like a promotional piece I mean it's nice that we have him actually signing the guitar right here while he was throwing back a cold one 
but 18,000. I mean, 2004 Les Paul Custom, that's like, a, you know, being generous, a $4,500 guitar. So to sell for that, I'm sorry, Les's signature, he signs so many things. It generally does not bring any premium at all, but it might convince somebody to maybe want it, you know, just for the story. But they got really lucky on that. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, at least it's a historic reissue 1957. So that bumps it up a little bit. Oh wow, this ZZ Top signed Epiphone Strange Coronet brought in 1750. Did they do that Explorer? Did I miss that one? Yes, we did, but there appears to have been some drama. <laughs> so it apparently sold for 10,000, which is way too much in my opinion. But then they must not have actually paid for it. So they re-auctioned it and it sold for 4,000. I would have paid 4,000 for that. Yeah, that's not a problem at all. But then it looks like it didn't sell that time. <laughs> And then it sold for 5750 Okay, I could still see up to 6000 for that particular piece. So to get it off of this guy, it looks like you'd have to offer him like 8600 I mean, just in case you didn't know, Heritage does let you make offers to these guys, but just because you're willing to pay that doesn't mean that he's going to sell it. You might have to offer him the 10000 original one. So there you go. I guess you snooze, you lose. I would have happily paid 4000 for that. But anyways, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed the stories tonight. That ransom burst was really cool. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.